Young Trinidad and Tobago Emerging Writers. Let's give them another round of applause, please. And all of us in the audience who uh, wish that we could write like that and just dream too. Speaking about wishing and dreaming to be a great writer, my pleasure to introduce Shivani Ramlochan. Shivani is a fiction writer, poet, and critic. She reviews books and plays for the Trinidad Guardian Sunday Art Section and is the book review editor for the Caribbean Beat magazine. She's the official blogger and social media manager for paper-based bookshop, Trinidad's sole independently Caribbean specialty bookseller, and she functions in the same capacity for the NGC Focus Lit Fest, Trinidad's annual literary festival. Her creative writing has been published in Tongues of the Ocean, Draconian Switch, and the Caribbean Review of Books. And if I might end by saying I'm a huge fan of Shivani's writing, both her critical writing in The Guardian and her poetry and her autobiographical writing, when we're all lucky enough to see her posted on Facebook. Welcome to the microphone, Shivani. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to begin by reading the post that Gabrielle alluded to, which, surprisingly enough, I wrote on the arrival day, arrival day just um, half distractedly, not expecting it would get the kind of, or have the kind of resonance that it did. So I'll read that for you first, and then read a short story. The post is It's Indian Arrival Day. Anyone who knows me knows I have complex feelings about my Indianness and what being Indian in Trinidad means. I suspect this is how many of us feel about our roots, whether we're happy with where they're planted, or whether we use our nails and best tools to dig ourselves free of their buttress truths. Being Indian means being in constant conflict with that as a label, a title, and a way of saying I exist. Here, I think of myself as Trinidadian, not a hyphenation, not a continental scrap of flotsam, not a ZTV adherent. I'm a Trinidadian who remembers her grandfather playing the harmonium, and every one of her grandmother's white lace or knees. A Trinidadian who marked the early years of her life by Hindu funerals and weddings. A Trini with a tassa pulse and a respect for Cain with both fear and awe but not, that's not uncommon to the way one is taught to love God. Some of my favorite superheroes have four arms and blue skin. Some of my best and worst memories are set to the soundtrack of bhajans I don't understand, but ones that have business with me. I have handed out Parasada Diwali. I have had my last name laughed at because it begins with Ram. I have had good Indian hair, thick and black and strong, that reached down to my ass and prompted not so good Indian men to call me pretty Bollywood boy when I was 11. I have inherited fear and vehement dislike of Indian men. I have worn many and danced at massacres and sung in temple and fallen in and out of faith and done so much that befits and marks me as a member of a culture that roots in this island that are unsinkable, unshakable, heavy and complex and dread. I carry that aspera under my tongue every day and I use that tongue to talk about home. We are always talking about home, even when exile is the only word we think we know. We are always reaching far back when we stand still and sovereign we are always arriving. I am grateful to my family for coming here and for working in the fields. I work on their backs with their blood ringing in my ears, always trying to sort out what it means. I didn't cross any dark water, but I will always think of how they did, how they brought me here and their memory and fear and resolve, how that is always worth working for. So that's the post. The story is called Everything Else They Prefer Hunt. They killed Prabha and stuffed her. Sari Hem first, down a ravine in rainy season. They wrapped her fuchsia pullover around her neck and made a gallows of her silk gauze. Thigh to peony love, she breathed against his knee after temple three nights before. 
the feel of it when we break our fast together. Surin breaks at the airport lights. The plane was coming in from someplace inevitably colder, nose bound for the Piago tarmac. Wings wide and purple tipped and ready to empty passengers into the festival night. The sides of the jeep dropped faintly as the plane passed directly overhead. Vibration spreading up the inside of his right thigh, resting somewhere south of his belt buckle. Rust was beginning to spread over the metal backs of the airport roundabout scarlet ibises. Brown spots blooming under the cheap red paint. Last weekend's rains had battered them out of sheep, forced their wings slanted and anatomically imprecise. An ibis with bows set this way would never fly right, so I knew. It would sink to the bottom of the mangrove, settle thick around twisted roots, or else wind up in a poacher's net, pink-breasted meat ready for a tanty's proud Christmas curry. The first time they'd eaten ibis, Soren had been twelve. He remembered spitting the bird flesh onto the Ranjan's tiled porch, remembered the bright bell of Prabhupada's laughter breaking over his ears. Chupidi, she hissed, bending to pick up the half cheap thigh, more of a hero. Her rottweiler's tongue curled around her palm as she fed him the thing that just fell from Surin's mouth. She got down on her knees, petting the beast, planting a kiss behind his ear, stroking along the shine of his short coat. They fed Hero the rest of the wild meat that night, and every other night when the Ranjan's rifles took down small game in the forest behind their house. The ibis they buy, Prabhupada said. Everything else they prefer hunt. Iguana, Maniku, there with weak legs. It didn't matter. No matter what Prabhupada's parents and brothers dragged back to the dinner table, Suran had never been able to stomach any of it. You want me to talk to her? July edged the bed of her thumbnail with a small plastic file. Scraps of magenta varnish chipped off her hands and onto the pressed skirts of her uniform. Surin heard her suck her teeth, heard the impatient scrape of palms against Serge as she dusted the polish down her knees and onto the floor. No, it's all right. Might be something useful in her abuse. Piago gave her to St. Helena. Nothing stirred at the junction except for a lone patron ducking his KFC, sucking his wallet loose from the back pocket of blue overalls. Quiet, July said, stowing her file in the glove compartment of the Jeep, peering at the sealed up shop fronts, the empty gas station, the guest house perched atop St. Helena's first ever mini -mart. It's not here, you still have one set of hookers. The easy rest sign flickered on and off a neon plate with one glowing wing parked alongside an announcement the cheapest rates the side of the airport. Something like that, Sir replied, his gaze flickering over the step landing where Prop had waited six years ago to steal a snapshot of saffron yellow pumps sprawling outside the cargo with his room. Coetious, she breathed, her camera phone chiming in unison with the softness of her prayer. July waited, tapped her nails against the dash, Still glancing up at the motel, as if the rain's thick steps would deliver a tattoo of high heels on wet concrete, or the giggle of a voice plastered tongue to throat with whichever liquor worked longest. Everyone's busy in their backyards drinking coke, watching their kids burn their fingers with starlights, he told her. Hanging a left past the Ruka taxi stand, where no cars idled, engines running and old talk passing the fluid lick of invective from one greasy air to another cigarette dangling mouth. Nobody worked tonight, unless there was a need. The roads to Las Lomas hadn't changed, except to get worse. Soren swerved the potholes he could recall and weathered the unfamiliar sinks in the asphalt. The jeep skittering grey water on the calves of girls to the ring suites of their neighbors' glowing houses. One of them peered into the open window as they passed. Hey, wait for Parasad. She stuck a hand into the car. Her bangles clattered, glitter clinging to the hairs on her wrist and forearm. July took two plastic Ziploc bags in her open palms, the smell of ghee and sugar-shoved raisins. Flour drunk on milk and maraschino cherries filled the vehicle. Shukwali, the girl smiled. Her hands on July's and her eyes on Surin. He nodded. The bags jostled on July's lap as he took another corner, 
avoiding a pot ham, crossing the road in unhurried, holy night climbing. Put those in the back, that shit will stain your skirts, there's always oil in those bags, no matter how they try to wipe them clean. Slow down, she said, fishing her notepad out her pocket, uncapping a pen to scribble the witness's name and occupation. Bar owner, he saw a scroll in her looping cursive, related to officer. She added as an afterthought, tucking the disclaimer or declaration just beneath his grandmother's name. Her nib faltered over the final word. The bar was both open and closed, as it always was, since the first Diwali he could remember. Both locks sat in their customary positions in the short length of chain link. The iron grate pulled shut and double proofed against bandits, back and owl, and bad credits. Gravel crunched under tire wheels as he parked, crooked, the only people in the yard. The whole family would be next door at Uncle Purna's house, scattered throughout the red curtained, gilt ceiling rooms, blazing exhausted around the pool of the Carraras and crumpled Cortez, sequins dropping into the chlorine depths. His uncle's balustrades were lined with deers, most of them guttering out. He stood at the sealed entrance to Rahim's rest and bar. Rum shops like these never closed for custom, no matter how locked they seemed on the outside. Aji, he called into the darkness. The last drunkard hadn't bothered to rack up the pool cues, and they lay crossed over each other on the table, missing only a skull in the place where they were joined. He bit back the laugh in the very moment that his grandmother stepped out to meet him, drying her hands in the folds of her house dress. What you want. She pinned the white lace hem of her knee, tucking the other end in the front of her bodice. The first time Suran had seen Prabha wearing her knee, hadn't been on Diwali night, hadn't been so anyone else could see either. He swallowed, shifted. He wondered how many bullets he had in his gun. Where were you? on the night Prabha Ranjan was murdered, Aji. She tilted her head back, laughed in the glow of the soft drink fridges, one hand propped on her waist where she was clutching the brass keyring tight. Her laugh was the same, like mummy's best kitchen plate shattering in something molten as key, but richer, just as rich as gold and heavier to carry. An empty bear bottle rolled near her feet and she squatted to pick it up, hefting it in one palm as if testing it for the throw. He watched it bounce in her palm. He saw someone else's oily fingerprints on it and wondered if the drinker had stopped for a quick, secret buzz after dropping off plastic or brown paper bags of flour soaked in milk and butter and enough sugar to kill a family slowly over time. She laughed what felt like a full minute, the gold in her front tooth glinting, made rich by the gold of her good humor. Nobody killed that boy, Saroon. She narrowed her eyes, set the bottle down on the comp top behind her, strip and fall, he fall. He stared at her, seeing the solitary white streak of Chandan bisecting the wrinkles in her brow. He wondered who had done this year's puja, which fingers had pressed the wet powder to her skin, which voice had recited the bhajans. He wanted to tell her that this year, for the first time, his sadaroti swelled in a perfect, pregnant moon over the stove top. He nearly burnt his hands on the tower in sheer glee and the recognition of that he could make the only bread that mattered, just as she had shown him, in and out of every year. He closed his eyes briefly. The taste of fresh sado, butter broken over its flame warm back, crept over his tongue, and he bit hard until the acidic blue of copper washed it clean again. Please, Aji, it is illegal to lie to me. You know that. Her hand shot through the grating. Surat's cheek hit the first lock as she dragged him up against the barricade that protected her business, clutching him by the shirt front, her fingers twisting in the stand issue heavy cotton, flicking off his badge like a poor excuse for precious metal. It landed in the drain with a damp thud. He heard the sound echo hollow in his ears, he heard the jeep door open, heard himself say no, it's all right, to July's shout a cry of shock. He heard her cock her pistol, he heard the sounds of the night that she wouldn't use it. His grandmother looked past him, to a fixed point over his shoulder. She didn't touch his skin. 
She didn't touch any part of him which she might not be able to pray clean beneath her mango tree the next morning. Dirty boy, she said, rattling him upright against her bar. So it is a sin to lie to me. It was always a sin to lie to me. She shook him harder, as if trying to unhinge something in him that might rinse off in the next cycle of rain and river water. Her spit flecked in his cheeks, on the bridge of his nose, on the beds of eyelids he couldn't open. Dirty boy, she decided, pushing him away with the flat of her palm. He staggered backwards, wiping the wetness from his face, feeling more moisture take its place. He knew he wouldn't come clean. Get out of my yard. She turned and went back through the swinging door to the corridor he and his brother painted three years ago, emptying out the dregs of one quart of apple white onto their paintbrushes, careful not to spill a drop. The jangle of her keys followed her, the uneven gait of one swollen, arthritic leg, keeping offbeat time with the other. The loose end of her orny fluttered down her back like a victory pennant, white lace wilting in the quiet of the Diwali night folding in on itself. It was July, he fished his badge of the drain, wincing as she brushed spent cigarette ends from it and dried it on her oil down the street. Anything? She asked. He shook his head. Look, July pointed to the balcony of his uncle's house. A young girl stood at the closest corner to the road, a plastic pitcher of oil held aloft in one hand, a cell phone in the other. Soren stepped as close as he could to the border of his uncle's driveway, curled his fingers in the gates, tipped by cast iron flutely. Two trumpeting, Calcutta shipped ceramic elephants framed the driveway pillars. Garlands of hibiscus and white Zora looped around their thick necks, tangling in the ivory of their tusks. The girl set her oil pitcher down at her feet. She waved so hard that Soren could hear the triumphant peal of her bangles drifting down to the courtyard. He waved back, pocketing his badge, hoping that his bangle was well hidden enough in the crease of his trousers. He could hear her bangles click and collide against each other, glass gliding over glass as she tapped out a message on her phone and her head bent. The dia she attended lit the long arm of the balcony with a gleam that promised they would meet the dawn. He knew what it was to be the sole lamp lighter in the small hours. His fingers ached, bereft of oil, at the memory. He tapped open the envelope that buzzed to life in the center of his phone screen. It's really good to see you, Uncle Soran. When he looked up, her eyes were on his, dear bright. He nodded, pressed his forehead to the gate, smiling hard enough to show her the truth in his white teeth. He smiled until his jaw ached. His phone buzzed again. I'm sorry about what happened to Uncle Ranel. Siren bit the inside of his cheek, bled more copper into the cavern of a mouth he suspected would never taste like melted butter on roti skin again. He tapped out in response. He, she preferred it to be called proper sweetie. He didn't look up, he couldn't. He watched the flower garland swing against the tusks of their gatekeeper gods, out of periphery of his blurring vision. Maybe he could stay like this, frozen against the frame of his uncle's gate. Maybe in the morning his uncle's dogs could break him open on their teeth, like fresh ibis meat, piercing through his skin with a pink, raw core. This way, this way, he might be something useful to his surname. His cell phone buzzed in his fist. Uncle, I'm so sorry about what happened to Auntie Papa. When he looked up, she was going, Take him to the ravine, he told July, tossing him the keys. Take me where it happened. The river that ran through the back of the Runjan's property was deep in some places. He and Prabha had learned this as children, wading in the shallows, pitching stones over its thin throats, watching the rocks sink down to fathoms they could only guess at. They knew just what their parents would do if they even dared of wading into those depths. The first time Prabha disobeyed her mother and father, she wore the switch marks on the back of her calves like lines of honor, displaying them to anyone who cared to see during recess. Twirling this way and that, her khakis drawn up to the knee. The stripes of an adventure, she said, winking at Cyril. She dragged him into the boys' bathroom that evening and kissed him with the mouth of a girl who dared against her parents. The girl who knew the taste of dark water and the wells of his birth. 
Soren skidded down the embankment into the heart of the ravine. The river rushed behind him, a roaring in his ears, deeper and wider than it was when Prabha tested it for the first time. He crouched down in the spots where July's chalk marks still lingered, thick lines and white on government's guttering. He pressed his hands over the skeleton she made, following it from end to end, filling in his palms with dirt and white dust. He smelled the beast before he saw him, hero's familiar stink, his fur damp from river walking, his tongue pink and lolling and licking into Surat's hands before the policeman could stop him. Prabha's howl tumbled into Surat's arms, knocking him onto his side, stretching him out alongside the space where she lay for the last time. He pressed his nose into the rock warrior's coats, breathing in the flesh of a body that loved wild meat. Breathing deep in the dog, even the very first thing he once found it impossible to swallow. Snake, he told Hero, clinging to the animal's scruff, burying a shiver in his voice somewhere deep, somewhere safe. Let's try a snake next, okay? Yeah, I don't think your mama ever fed you snake. A nice, juicy mappy bee. I'll eat with you. We'll eat it all, I promise. In the distance, on the borders of the Ranjan's land, he heard rifle shots split the darkness sinking oil and heat into it, piercing it with flares that burned brighter than a thousand daylights. He shut his eyes and listened to Prabhu's brothers hunting. That's the end of the story. <laughs> Just one last thing before I leave the stage. I never explain my story, so this is highly unusual. It's not an explanation. Just think of it as a postscript. Indianness is not the province of a light skin. The Val Sane dwelling, the Satsang throwing, just like Indian feminism, this is the promise of the Sindhu wearing, mehendi clad, symposium attending, bangle clinking, constantly and righteously self brimming of us with sings, Mahavirs, Mohips, and Ramlo chants behind our first names. For me, Indo Caribbean feminism isn't a plinth, it is a bridge. It isn't an all inclusive dwelling like our effects, it's an open palm. If your Indo Caribbean feminism makes no room, and holds no breathing space, no blossom of fierce welcome for double identity, trans women's identities, dark skin identities, femme women's identities. If your Indo Caribbean feminism isn't intersectional, then it is suspect and it breeds all the wrong kinds of complacent insularity in Trans Tobago in 2015.